Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Freemasonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. I'm your host, Brother Robert Johnson. This is episode 153. All right, let's jump right into the news. A couple things I wanted to mention off the top of the show is that, of course, we just updated the bookstore on our website, wcypodcast.com. Com. So if you click on the bookstore, you're going to see a lot of the books from people who have been on the show and some that haven't. However, all of those books are by brothers and they're uh, really good books. I wouldn't put them on there if they weren't. Um, but I did want to let everybody know that two of the books in the bookstore actually help in the cost of this show to offset it. Uh, of course, I'm referring to Brother Tech and illustrious Brother Stephen L. Harrison, who have both generously decided to give $1 from the sale of each book to WCY, or Whence Came You, this show, to help offset the cost and make this show keep happening. So, Brother Tech's book, which is called A Christian Perspective on Masonic Symbols, and, of course, Brother Stephen L. Harrison's book, Tales from the Craft. Both in the bookstore, both of them are Kindle books. I think they're both $3. And if you buy either one of those books, $1 comes back to the show, at least for a little while, is the promotion that they're running with me, which is, again, just so generous. So if you guys check those out, you'll be supporting the show. Secondly, uh, I did want to mention that I had some lodge coins made for uh, my mother lodge, Waukegan Lodge number. 78 AF and AM of the Grand Lodge of Illinois, and we are giving those coins to our members. However, we are using them as a fundraiser as well, so if you would like a Waukegan Lodge number 78 coin, go ahead and send me an email over at wcypodcast at gmail.com, and what we can do is uh, if you purchase it, then what I will do is I will take that money and bring it directly to the lodge, and you will have a cool coin, and you're helping out Waukegan Lodge. Third thing I wanted to mention is also within my home lodge. So if you are in the northern east district of Illinois, the 28th of this month, we are going to be having a fellowship night. We're going to be screening a movie and doing some dinner. So we will have uh, dinner at 6, and the movie will be at 7. We're going to be watching the Freemason movie. So it is a candidate kind of night. So if you want to be a candidate for masonry, if you're interested in masonry, or if you are a entered apprentice, a fellow craft, or master mason, come on out. Wives, girlfriends, doesn't matter who you bring along with. Everybody's welcome to come. I just wouldn't recommend bringing anybody under the age of, say, 15 just because of the mature subject matter of the film. So check that stuff out. If you want any more information about it, go ahead and send me an email at wcypodcast at gmail.com. So this week we have a really cool piece, which was from the Petrie Stones Review of Freemasonry website, and it's entitled The Dead Sea Scrolls, and it's by Right Worshipful Brother Leon Zeldis. So let's jump right into it. During the centuries, the only known references about the Essenes were a few brief mentions in the writings of Plinius Philo and Flavius Josephus. Only in April 1947, this situation changed when an Arab shepherd looking for a stray goat found several large ceramic jars hidden in a cavern up on the hill near the northern shore of the Dead Sea. The jars contained some rolls of parchment wrapped in cloth. These are the famous Dead Sea Scrolls, which since their discovery and decipherment have caused profound revolution in the thinking about the history of the Jewish religion in the crucial period of the early first century of the CE and thrown new light on the origins of Christianity. Later searches in the other nearby caves resulted in the discovery of other rolls and numerous parchment fragments. The total number of scrolls when they were intact is estimated to have been over 1,000. Until now, 870 different parchments have already been identified. The fragments differ in size. Some of them are no larger than a thumbnail. In one cavern alone, number four, some 15,000 fragments were found. Although we refer to the Dead Sea manuscripts as parchment scrolls, some were written on papyrus, and one is written, or rather incised, on a copper foil. This is the scroll that describes the hiding places of the Jerusalem Temple's treasures, removed from the temple by the priests in Bar Kokhba's time, to save them from the Roman legions led by Titus. The scrolls are written in several Semitic languages, although for the most part, in Hebrew. An important point to remember is that 
Until the discovery of these scrolls, scholars were of the opinion that in the beginning of the Christian era, Hebrew was a dead language used only by the educated few, such as Latin was in the Middle Ages of Europe. The rabbinical Hebrew used in the literature of the years 200 and later was regarded as a scholastic invention, not a language of daily use. This belief led historians to conclude that the Gospels could not have been written originally in Hebrew or Aramaic. The discovery of the scrolls refuted these opinions. It became clear that the Jews of the Second Temple period, after the return of the Babylonians' exile, used simultaneously both Hebrew and Aramaic. These two languages are closely related. In writing, however, the ancient Hebrews preferred using the biblical language, that is, Hebrew. The history of the discovery of these documents and their vicissitudes until finding suitable repository at the hands of archaeologists could serve to write a novel. I shall try to summarize very briefly the main course of events. As already mentioned, at the end of spring in 1947, some Bedouin shepherds of the Tamir tribe discovered by chance the jars containing scrolls. One of the parchment bundles, later denominated the Isaiah Manuscript, was offered for sale to an Arab antiquities merchant in the town of Bethlehem. To understand what happened then, we must remember that at that time Palestine was still under the rule of the British Army. While the United Nations discussed the fate of the British mandate that was researching its conclusion, there was still contact between the Arab and Jewish communities in Palestine, but venturing into certain sectors had become hazardous, and violent confrontations were becoming more frequent from day to day. The Arab merchant did not assign much importance to the old parchment, believing it had no great value, and he refused to pay the sum asked by the Bedouin. 20 English pounds. The Bedouin then turned to a merchant belonging to the Syrian Orthodox community, living in Bethlehem, and this made contact with his friend, a Jerusalem merchant. In this roundabout way, the discovery of the scrolls came to the attention of the Syrian Orthodox Metropolitan, equivalent to an archbishop, of the St. Mark Monastery in the old city of Jerusalem. After a short while, the archbishop Monsignor Athanasios Samuel bought four of the scrolls. He then showed them to several persons, among them some members of the Biblical and Archaeological College of the Dominicans in Jerusalem who also considered the manuscripts as being of recent origin and having little value. Around the months of August 1948, Bishop Samuel informed a Jewish physician, Dr. Brown, about the discovery of the scrolls and asked his opinion. Dr. Brown communicated this information to Professor Yehunda Magnus president of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, who in turn transmitted the news to the university library and asked that some manuscript experts examine the scrolls. Two envoys from the university library visited the Syrian monastery, and the bishop showed them the sum of the manuscripts, not revealing their source. The library clerks, after examining the manuscripts, concluded they lacked the necessary expertise to determine their antiquity and proposed a further examination by someone better qualified for the task. However, before the Hebrew university could send its expert, Bishop Samuel decided to return to Syria, taking the scrolls with him. That took place during a turbulent period of armed struggle between Arab and Jewish groups, resulting in numerous casualties. Let's go back in time. On the 25th of November 1947, a Jerusalem antiquary showed to Professor Eliezer Sukhanik of the Hebrew University a parchment fragment written in the Old Square Hebrew alphabet, which Sukhanik immediately identified as similar to the inscriptions on sarcophagi dating from the Hashmonean era, that is, the two centuries before the first century following the birth of Jesus. To make the story short, on the 29th of November, Sukhanik bought three parchment rolls and also two of the ceramic jars that contained them. On that day, the United Nations voted to end of the British Mandate and the partition of Palestine. Arab armies immediately invaded the country from all sides, and Israel's War of Independence started. This caused the complete break of relations between the Arab and Jewish communities in Palestine. Nevertheless, Professor Sukhanik succeeded in maintaining contact with the Arabs involved in the matter. At that time, one of the workers in the university library related to Professor Sukhanik the episode with the Syrian Archbishop, and Sukhanik immediately realized that those parchments had the same origin. He tried to visit the monastery of St. Mark to examine the manuscripts, but the monastery was already cut off from Jewish sector of Jerusalem, and travel between the two sides was impossible. 
At the end of January 1948, Sukhanik received a message from Anton Kiraz, a member of the Syrian community who communicated that he had in his possession several old parchments and wanted to show them. Sukhanik emerged to find a neutral place to meet with Kiraz. After some negotiations, they finally met in the YMCA building close to the old city, but still within the Jewish sector. When Sukhanik examined the scrolls brought by Kiraz, he realized they belonged to the same group of those he had already purchased. He took three of the scrolls to be examined by other experts, and they all concluded they were authentically old. A protracted negotiation now started to purchase the scrolls. David Ben-Gurion, the president of the Jewish Agency and later Israel's first prime minister, was approached, and his approval was secured to allocate the necessary funds, although the war made more urgent demands on the scant resources of the Jewish population. Meanwhile, however, the Syrian Orthodox decided to wait until the end of hostilities to get a better price, and then, through the American College of Oriental Studies in Jerusalem, the manuscripts were transferred to the United States. On the 11th of April, of that same year, 1948, a publication in the United States disclosed that the American scholars in Jerusalem had identified for the first time some of the Dead Sea manuscripts as being to a period preceding the destruction of the Jerusalem Temple in the year 70 CE. This news evoked great interest in scientific circles. Sukhanik then decided to publish a first study on the parchments, a booklet that appeared with the title, The Hidden Scrolls. To conclude this story, Professor Sukhanik purchased three scrolls while his son, the archaeologist and army general, Yigal Yadin, eventually bought it in New York, the four scrolls owned by the Syrian archbishop. An eighth scroll, the important temple parchment, was purchased by Yadin after the end of the Six Days War of 1967, when Jerusalem was finally reunited. The seven original scrolls are now exhibited in the Museum of the Book, part of Jerusalem's Israel Museum. They are the following. Manual of Discipline, presently known as the character of a sectarian Jewish association. Histories of the Patriarchs, Psalms of Thanksgiving. A commentary on Habakkuk, the war between the sons of light and the sons of darkness, and two copies of the book of Isaiah. Apart from the scrolls, as I mentioned, thousands of parchment fragments have been discovered whose translation and publication has taken many decades and caused sharp disputes in scholar circles. They are kept at present in Jerusalem's Rockefeller Museum and their publication has been completed only recently. The antiquity of the Dead Sea Scrolls was conclusively proven when some samples were tested in April of 1991 in a Swiss laboratory dating them around the beginning of the Christian era. Archaeologists basing themselves on the writing had already reached the same conclusion that the parchments could not be later than the year 68 when Roman legions reached Qumran and the settlements there was liquidated. The importance of the scrolls for our understanding of the evolution of rabbinical Judaism in that crucial period of the end of the Herodian rule, the destruction of the Jerusalem temple, and the birth of Christianity cannot be overstated. The last section of the Hebrew Bible the book of Daniel dates to about 150 BC, while the earliest rabbinic writing is the Mishnah, redacted in about 200 AD. The period between these two dates was a blank hole until the discovery of the scrolls. A measure of their importance for scholarship can be judged by the number of Dead Sea Scrolls studies published. A bibliography of publications between 1970 and 1995 lists about 6,000 items. Approximately a quarter of the Dead Sea Scrolls are biblical manuscripts, including fragments of every book of the Hebrew Bible except Esther. What interests us is to take a look at the content of the scrolls written 2,000 years ago and to advance some theories about their possible connection with Masonic legends and traditions. Qumran. First, let us learn something about the people who wrote the scrolls, the circumstances when they were written, and this will help us judge their significance. Near the caverns where the scrolls were found are the ruins of Qumran, a structure that has been identified by archaeologists as the first known monastery in the Western world. There is little doubt that this place was inhabited for a long period of time, lasting over a century. The first archaeologist to make scientific excavations in the place Father DeVoe of the Biblical School of Jerusalem arrived to the conclusion that this was a meeting place for the Essenes, and since this settlement is not very large, DeVoe assumed that most of the members of this sect lived in the nearby caves and came down to the main building only to meet, share the meals, take ritual baths, and pray together. 
In the course of years, this theory was disputed by other researchers, but the latest discoveries of archaeologist Magan Broshi, who was for many years curator of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Israel Museum, and Dr. Hanan Eshel of Bar Elan University confirmed irrefutably DeVoe's assumptions. These archaeologists discovered the paths leading from the Qumran ruins to the caves and found their 2,000-year-old sandal nails, as well as coins of the epoch and pottery. The Essenes who were the inhabitants of Qumran? Who wrote or preserved these parchment documents in the Dead Sea Caverns? The Essenes were one of the minor factions of the Jewish people in the Hashmonian period. The main groups, as we know, were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. After the conquest of the Middle East by Alexander the Great, and after his death in the year 323 BCE, Palestine became a battleground between two of his generals, Seleucus, who governed Syria, and Ptolemy, in Egypt. A descendant of Seleucus, Antioch Epiphanius Epiphanes IV, tried to impose paganism on the Jews, introducing the cult of Zeus and the other Greek gods. This resulted in the revolt of the Maccabees in the year 165 BC. After a cruel war, the Jews, under the leadership of Judah Maccabee, Maccabee in Hebrew means the hammer, defeated the Greek generals and achieved independence. Although Judah Maccabee died in battle, his descendants, beginning with John Hyrcanus, continued the Hashmonian dynasty, marked by continuous fraternal wars and the growing menace of Roman power. It was in this tempestuous period of history that the Essenes separated themselves from the main current of Judaism, consisting what today would be called an ultra-Orthodox sect. They considered that the end of the world was near, the Apocalypse, and they tried to observe strictly all the prescriptions of the Torah, that is, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Some writers indicate that St. John the Baptist may have been a member of the sect, and even Jesus had been mentioned as a possible member. The name Essene in Hebrew means pious. The Essenes were ascetic, practicing frequent fasts and daily ritual baths. They studied the holy writings assiduously, and they conducted themselves democratically. The Essene Organization Among the Dead Sea Scrolls, there are two in particular that throw light on the organization and principles of the Essenes. This is the scroll called Manual of Discipline and the Zadokite document. The first is included among the Qumran scrolls, while a copy of the second was discovered at the end of the 19th century by Solomon Schechter in the storeroom of the Ezra Synagogue in Fostat, the old quarter of Cairo. It's a known fact that old Hebrew religious texts are not destroyed because the name of God appears on them, but they are stored in a special repository or storeroom of the synagogue. The community rule. We shall now examine some of the rules of the Dead Sea community and decide whether they bear some resemblance to Masonic traditions. When a person desired to join the community that they themselves called Yahad, or together, he had to undertake to respect God and men, practice virtue, and avoid evil. This is quite similar to the passage in the opening ritual of the Lodge in the first degree of the Scottish Rite. When the question is asked, for what purpose are we assembled, the answer is to raise temples to virtue and dig dungeons to vice. Also, in the initiation ritual, the candidate is enjoined to choose the path of virtue and not that of vice. The statement of belief in a supreme being is also a required part of the initiation ceremony. The community examines the background of the candidate, his character, and his fulfillment of religious precepts. Each person was then inscribed in a particular rank, coming under the authority of a superior. Believers were known as the children of light. This is an important detail. Masons are also known as children of the light. The followers of Jesus are likewise referred to as the sons of light. John 12, 35-36. In the parable of the unjust steward, Jesus also spoke of the sons of light. We must remember that the Gospels of Luke and John were composed about 200 years after the Manual of Discipline. Receiving the light is the crucial point of the initiation ceremony. The sun and its light plays a prominent role in Masonic rituals. The sun and the moon, symbols of day and night light are displayed prominently in the Masonic Temple. At a crucial moment in the initiation ceremony, the word light is used. In the Yahad, when the candidate was initiated in the community, the priests pronounced a special blessing. The members of the community were divided into three classes, the priests, Levites, and the people. This brings to mind the division between apprentices, fellow crafts, and master masons. Every year, the progress of every member of the community was assessed for the oldest to the youngest initiate. Each one was classified anew, 
so that no one may be reduced in his state or exalted above his appointed place. Members of the community took meals together, prayed together, and held debates. Quote, in the presence of the priest, all take seats according to their respective ranks, and the same order is adopted to speak. End quote. This is also the tradition in Lodge, where the brethren take their seats according to the degree, and in the Scottish Rite Lodges, they are granted the right to speak also, following a set of order determined by rank. In the community debates, all could take part following their order, but no one could interrupt another, nor speak before his turn according to his rank. Nobody could speak about matters other than those of interest to the entire community. This reminds us of the procedure of Masonic debates and the quote-unquote raisings or the general good part in the ritual when the brethren are invited to speak up. If a person wanted to join, he was interrogated by a superintendent concerning his intelligence and his behavior. Then, if considered suitable, he was presented to the general assembly where everyone gave his opinion and his admission or rejection was decided by vote. One of the rules concerning admission into the community specifies that, quote-unquote, no person with physical defect crippled on both legs or arms, lame, blind, deaf, dumb, or having visible physical defect can join. A similar restriction appears in the old Masonic documents. If the candidate was accepted and took an obligation to comply with the rules of the community, he was admitted on trial for a year, during which time the initiate could take part in the discussion only as an observer. After this first year, he was again examined to verify his progress. If this was considered adequate, he was allowed to continue for a second year. But then he had to bring his belongings and the tools of his trade, which were turned over to the Minister of Work for safekeeping. Only after the second year following further examination, he was formally accepted, sworn in, and inscribed in the register of the Brethren of the Community. This succession of trial periods and examinations are reflected also in the practices in our lodges. The candidate is examined before initiation and later before advancing to each further degree. The neophyte had to imitate the purity of his matters, that is, practice the rules of decency and walk in perfect sanctity. He undertook to follow a long road in search of enlightenment. The congregation counted twelve brothers and three priests, well versed in the law, called a perfect sanctity. This brings to mind the three pillars of the Christian church, James, Cephas, and John. Galatians 2, 9, and the 12 apostles, of course, the number 3 and 12, appear frequently in the Masonic rituals. In the Scottish Rite Lodge, the master and the two wardens are called the lights of the lodge. The royal arch meets under the banners of the 12 tribes of Israel, etc. An interesting passage is the following, quote, they, the members of the community, will be a precious cornerstone. This phrase recalls verses 16 through 17 in Cipher in chapter 28 of Isaiah. Quote, Behold, I lay the stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. I shall make justice a measuring line, and righteousness the plumb line. In Masonic initiation, the neophyte is placed in a particular position within the lodge and told that he is regarded as the cornerstone of the ideal temple we are building. Furthermore, an entire Masonic degree... The Mark Master refers specifically to the cornerstone. The measuring line in verse 17 is no other than the ruler, or it can be taken as representing the level, while the plumb line is the perpendicular, both symbols of the wardens. After the council meetings that ended with public confession and new collective blessing to the newly initiated, they devoted themselves, body and soul, to the great work to fulfill the congregation's statuses. Numbers 15.15, quote, The community is to have the same rules. This is a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. The masters included in their disciples mental discipline so that they could distinguish between good and evil, between light and darkness. Some of this is imparted in Masonic rituals. The Essenes also taught the principles of morality, tolerance, and human solidarity. These are mainstays of the Masonic teachings. The masters who inculcated liberal and democratic ideas to walk the path of honor and justice, to defend the innocent and the downtrodden, to protect the widow and the orphan, and above all, to assist the needy. All these are precisely the virtues close to the hearts of Masons. They also taught to dedicate themselves to work, combining individual effort with the meditation and study to achieve a high level of wisdom within a fraternal and just society. The members of this sect were educated in the art of meditation, reflecting on the meaning of life and the notion of loving one's neighbor. It is interesting to note that in Qumran ruins have been found numerous stone vessels, stone according to Jewish religion because it is a natural material not adulterated by human transformations such as the firing of clay, is not contaminated by the food and therefore does not have to be ritually cleansed, like 
earthen or metallic vessels. The initiates, whose ages varied between 25 and 50 years, learned to quote-unquote love justice and abhor evil. They regarded themselves as heirs of the priests, kings symbolized by Melchizedek or Melchizedek and Solomon. Some, like John the Baptist, made a vow as Nazarites. They must not be confused with the Nazarenes, those natives of Nazareth. The Nazarite, or from Nazir, separated or consecrated, consecrated himself fully to pious practices during the given period of time. He then abstained from wine or any other fermented drink, did not eat grapes or raisins, did not shave or cut his hair, and could not come near a corpse, not even of his closest family. When his period of separation had ended, he had to come to the entrance of the tabernacle and present an offering to the priest. Then the Nazarite cut his hair, could drink wine, and bathe himself. The Zadokite document contains a special section on the functions of the supervisor. The Hebrew word is the exact equivalent of the Greek episkopos, which is the origin of the word bishop. The supervisor was charged with educating the people and make them understand the works of God. He had to explain in detail the history of the past and to show them the same compassion that a father shows to his children. He also had to examine each neophyte regarding his conduct, intelligence, strength, courage, and possessions to give him the appropriate rank. His function was, in great measure, equivalent to that of the wardens in a Masonic lodge. Finally, I would like to mention that some Jewish writers maintain that a section of the Essenes was called Banaim, that is, the builders. It is not known why they were called with that name, but there is a reference in the Talmud that, quote-unquote, the masters in Israel are builders. From all this, we shouldn't jump to the conclusion that masonry may be the successor of the Essenes. The point of coincidence we have noted are significant, but do not prove filiation. What does appear evident is that both the Essenes and the speculative masons obeyed certain norms of conduct shared by all human beings who have reached a certain stage of spiritual development. The writer Aldous Huxley, in his book The Perennial Philosophy, presents a good argument to demonstrate the coincidence of mystic traditions in different times and cultures. The Dead Sea manuscripts are much more extensive than what I have described here. There are interesting passages about the end of time, biblical commentaries, hymns of praise, and much more. My purpose has been to focus only on some aspects of coincidence with Masonic rituals, particularly the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite that has received and kept major influence from esoteric traditions, alchemy, and Kabbalah. Freemasonry was not born in one piece, like the goddess Athena, but rather developed in an evolutionary process absorbing symbols and legends from various sources. The Essenes, though distant in time and space, appear to have been one of the remote precursors of our royal art. There is an extensive bibliography, if you care to read it, which is on their website. All right, so next I just wanted to make a quick mention on how this show is funded. Uh, it is listener-supported, so uh, you can help support this show when you go to the website wcypodcast.com and you purchase the show apps. The apps let you listen to the show, download your favorites, mark your favorites. You can listen to them streaming and Two of the bonus features about the app is that in every episode, the papers we read are available to our app users via PDF documents. So the paper we just read, if you want it, it's in the PDF on the app. So it's pretty cool. The app is available through Windows 8, Android, or Apple. Another way that we are funded is through onitlabs.com. So if you go there and you do some shopping for some healthy living stuff like hemp force protein, alpha brain, kettlebells, battle ropes, all that kind of uh, good stuff, uh, you can type in at the checkout, WCY, and that will give you 10% off, and they send a little bit back to the show. Of course, if you're going to do some shopping and you're a mason, you got to check out freemasonryart.com, run by our friend and brother Juan Sepulveda. He's an amazing fine artist. That's what he does for a living, but he also brings that together in masonry. So he has some amazing artwork that you can check out. He even does custom-made real lambskin aprons and these things are phenomenal i've seen two of them up close absolutely amazing you really owe it to yourself to check them out at least if it's something that you want on that website freemasonryart.com please use the promo code wcy at checkout when you do that you're going to get a percentage off as well as a little bit comes back to the show brother juan is really cool at the end of the month he will he will send the show an email letting us know you know, what we made, and it really does help out. So check it out. Of course, as we mentioned before, the bookstore, you can pick up either Tales from the Craft or A Christian Perspective on Masonic Symbols. Either one of those books 
We'll send a dollar back to the show for plenty of ways to donate. Uh, most popular, of course, is a PayPal donation, which you pick the amount, whether it's a dollar or $10 or whatever you want to donate. When you donate that money, it all goes right back into this show. I don't use the money for anything else. It is only used for hosting and equipment for the show. So thanks again in advance. And brings us into this week's famous Freemason, Ethan Nathan Allen. Born January 1st, 1904, and he passed away September 15th, 1993. He was an American center fielder in Major League Baseball from 1926 to 1938. He played for the Cincinnati Reds, 1926 to 1930, the New York Giants from 1930 to 1932, the St. Louis Cardinals from 1923 to 33, and the Philadelphia Phillies from 1934 to 36. He even played with the Cubs in 1936 also, and the St. Louis Browns in 36 through 38. He was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, and alumnus of the University of Cincinnati. In 1,123 games, he compiled 1,325 hits, 47 home runs, with a batting average of .300. He had an on-base percentage of .336 and a slugging average of .410. In 1935, he finished 17th in the Most Valuable Player voting with a batting average of .307 and a league-leading 156 games played. Allen remained well-known long after his retirement as a player as the inventor of the Kadako Ellis board game All-Star Baseball, which entered production in the early 1940s and remains available, with few changes today. All-Star Baseball and Stratomatic Baseball are two of the most popular baseball board games of the second half of the 20th century. Allen also became the baseball coach at Yale University, serving from 1946 until 1968. Reaching the College World Series finals in both 1947 and 1948, his players included future U.S. President George H.W. Bush. Allen passed away at age 89 in Brookings, Oregon. He was a member of Yateman Lodge No. 162 in Cincinnati, Ohio. That's it for this week. Please remember to find us on Facebook, follow on Twitter, check us out on Google Plus if that's what you like to do. Uh, we're under the email address wcypodcast at gmail.com. There is a personal page for it and a business page. I haven't quite figured those things out, but I mirror both things on both those pages, so it doesn't do you any good to subscribe to both of them. If you want to, cool. If not, just pick one. Otherwise, you're going to be seeing double posts all the time. Uh, please remember to check out the Masonic Roundtable, which is a show that airs every Tuesday night at 10, 9 Central. I am on as a panelist almost every week, as well as Brother John Ruark, Brother Jason Richards, Brother Juan Sepulveda, and Brother Nick Johnson completely surrounded by amazing talent and amazing intellect. It's a great show. I urge you all to check it out, www.themasonicroundtable.com. Again, Tuesdays at 10, 9 central p.m. Next, I wanted to quickly remind you guys to check out the Midnight Freemasons, which does publish three articles every single week, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, new content. We have 11 writers currently, and we're always looking for guest contributors as well. So if that's something you're interested in, please send me an email, wcypodcast at gmail.com. If it's a Masonic paper, I'd love to read it, and maybe we can get it up on the website. So if you'd like to check that out, it's www.midnightfreemasons.org. That's .org. If you like what you see there, please check out the Working Tools magazine. You can check that out at twtmag.com. The Working Tools is the largest independent Masonic magazine in the United States. It's a really good magazine. We have a section in the magazine every month, and there are several ways for you to be able to get that magazine. So you can get it via PDF, you can get it electronically through the newsstand, or you can get it in print like I do. If you get it in print, you also get the digital copy for free. So stay on the level. And for Whence Came You, I'm Robert Johnson. <laughs>